study in Revelation tonight, and uh, we're scheduled to finish it, but we won't do that tonight, but we may come close. We'll see how it goes. I um, want to thank you all for, uh, I think the word would be enduring with me <laughs> as we've gone through this together, especially Revelation, difficult to teach quickly, for sure, uh, but hopefully we're getting big ideas that we can share with uh, students next quarter. Um, I'm, I'm backing up to chapter uh, 17 tonight, which we covered uh, Sunday, just briefly, just to give us a running start again, a reminder of where we are in the flow of things. So uh, we're, we, prior to chapter 17, Babylon had been mentioned, and we're not really, weren't, weren't really told what that was or anything, but kind of explained in chapter 17 as this um, woman riding a, a great beast, uh, you know, comes out of the waters, she sets upon many waters, and they're identified as human societies, by the way, and that's one of the places we get the notion that the seas and the waters in Revelation represent human society. But chapter 7, verse 15 specifically says that about the waters that, she's, uh, that the beast is riding on. Uh, the kings of the earth have consorted with her on idolatry. She's called the great harlot for that reason. And uh, on her forehead is this uh, identifying... Uh, title, I suppose, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the, of the abominations of the earth. She's drunk with the blood of the saints, and she is supported by the beast, but she's also seemingly controlling it, as if she's riding it, I think. And then she is identified as a great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. And so I believe that she's the city of Rome. Uh, I think there's lots of good evidence for that, besides what's in this chapter, and we'll look at some of that in a minute. Uh, there's uh, some evidence a little bit later on even that I, I, it's the city of Rome, but some of my brethren disagree with that and they're welcome to be wrong or whatever, but no. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I think the preponderance of the evidence would point to Rome for sure. Although I, I read something today, you know, the, the um, premillennial folks say, well, it's, it's Rome renewed, basically that some European empire that they're looking for, you know, with the... Um, the, the, all of that, but that's a, that's their typical take on it. So the Scarlet Beast then, uh, many similarities to the Sea Beast in Revelation, which we identified as the Roman Empire. Again, you had, in, in its description, you have seven heads that are identified first as seven mountains, but also seven kings. Rome is famously known as the City of Seven Hills, uh, even still today. Um, among the kings, uh, Revelation says five of the seven kings had fallen, one is to come, one is and one is to come. Uh, there have been lots of efforts to identify the particular kings. I don't necessarily think that they are in sequential order, even in, in point of time, and I'm not even sure that there were seven. And I say that because uh, seven throughout the book of Revelation is a symbolic number uh, of a whole. Uh, and so, again, a lot of people wrangle about a lot of that that I don't, don't think is worth wrangling about. Uh, the ten horns are ten kings that come to rule briefly with the beast. They're going to make war with the lamb, but the lamb's going to overcome them. But eventually the, the harlot, uh, they'll turn on Babylon and uh, be instrumental in, in bringing her down as well, making her desolate. So that's what we saw in chapter 17. That leads us to chapter 18. And chapter 18 is a, a pretty easy chapter, if you will, if there are such things in Revelation, uh, because it's, it's essentially a uh, reaction to God's uh, judging Babylon, judging the harlot. And um, you have, first of all, in this chapter, uh, John sees a, an angel descend from heaven with great authority illuminating the earth. This is a number of great angels that he sees, and this one particularly, and they almost always have to do with uh, introducing a vision or a big part of a vision. So this angel cries mightily with a loud voice, Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen, has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean bird. All the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth became through her abundance and her luxury. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she has rendered to you. Repay her double according to her works, up which she has mixed, mixed double for her. I don't know if you're, you watch those, uh, if you're my age, those old westerns when you were a boy, and 
you know, they, they come into the saloon and somebody has said, give me a whiskey and make it a double. This, God, God has made it a double for Rome. Uh, what she has done to others, he has poured out double in her cup. And that's a just thing to do considering the kinds of things that she did. As we've already talked about, the blood of the saints was spilled in her streets and so on and so forth. Um, so God's people are to come out from her. Um, God is uh, just for his judgments upon her, and that's uh, indicated in the next uh, couple of verses uh, particularly. Uh, she glorified herself, it says in chapter 18, verse 7. Um, as you go through this, you'll see judgments coming upon her in one day and in one hour. Uh, that's repeated a number of times. Uh, I think it's more a reference to certainty than to time frame. And how the prophets use that as well when they talk about destruction, say, of literal Babylon or something like that, coming in one day or a year or whatever it was, um, that was certain and it may have been rapid, but the certainty of it may be more the emphasis in, in those references. All right, so how's everybody going to react to this? Here's this great city. She reigned over the kings of the earth. She had appeared beautiful from a worldly standpoint, she was filled with ugliness and nastiness. Uh, but now she's going to be taken down, she's fallen, uh, and what's the reaction going to be? Well, you have a reaction from three groups of folks that were aligned with her that are going to mourn and weep. The kings of the earth who drew power from her uh, are certainly going to be upset. Um, it says in verse 9, uh, they committed fornication, lived luxuriously with her. They're going to weep and lament for, when they see the smoke of her burning standing at a distance for fear of her torment. They don't want to be a part of her uh, destruction, uh, but they mourn it. Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Then the merchants will weep and mourn. Uh, no one buys their merchandise anymore. Here was their uh, way of you know, making money and trading. So this is representing, obviously, the uh, economic system uh, of, of, of Rome. Uh, all of the things that they had traded in. Uh, no longer can they make money on that. And if you read that list, it's kind of fascinating. At the end of it, in chapter thir in verse 13, rather, cattle and sheep and horses and chariots and bodies and souls of men. Uh, they were trading in the, in the souls of men. And then the shipmasters um, who were responsible for uh, shipping and that part of the trade, um, they weep verses 17, in one hour such riches are coming to nothing. Every shipmaster who, and those who travel on the ship, sailors, as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance. And you've got to remember the sea there is going to be human society, those who trade in human society at large. It's probably not talking about literal shipmasters, but again, all of this is symbolic of, of things. Um, in contrast to that, and I think this is maybe your big rock out of this chapter to me, as I look at this chapter, um, Verse 20, after all of this mourning and weeping and consternation, you know, rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. God has given his people justice. Heaven is told to rejoice. Uh, great geopolitical events and really events of all kinds. Um, receive a certain kind of reaction from people in the world. And much of the time, heaven's reaction is the opposite of that. Things that the world is sad about, heaven is glad about, and vice versa. And your reaction to something like this tells you where you stand uh, relative to heaven and earth, frankly. And I think young people need to see that. You, you know, it, we've had you know, movie stars and pop stars and whatnot, and they, they pass on and they just live godless lives and their influence on society has just been horrible. And, uh, you know, we're, we weep with the world about that like the world does. And I don't know if we ought to be doing that, frankly. Uh, how, how do we see the influence of such people in the world? And, and um, we ought to be sad when any lost soul passes away. Don't get me wrong about that. Uh, but to laud and praise these people uh, who really have have not done heaven's will, but have done the devil's will, 
in this world, and a lot of things like that. I mean, you can just go on and on. There's a whole big difference about how a person of the world sees something and a, and a Christian sees something. And your emotions, the way you react to those things, is the telltale sign of where your heart really is and where you're looking, whether you're looking at something from heaven's view or from a worldly view. Uh, and it's, it's a bit of a test. I, I think that might be something good to talk to the kids about. So you, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, political leaders and sports figures, you know, you throw bunches of folks into that. And, and bigger, broader events, something good or bad happens to, you know, some corporation that's known for this or that. Um, and... You know, it's, it's, it's everything you see on the news every night. I think our reactions as Christians are going to be different than the people in the world to most things, frankly, that are going on. Um, uh, but the, the, the fall of Babylon is, is full. It's uh, overwhelming. It's described in, in fairly uh, symbolic terms, a millstone cast into the sea. You know what? That's... It's not coming up again, right? (laughs) You cast a millstone in the sea, it's going to make a big splash, and it's going down, and it's going to stay down, right? Uh, The life is taken away, but judgment is is justified, and it's right for God to have done this. Um, Look at verse 23. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. The voice of the bridegroom, the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and all who were slain on the earth. Now, again, how, why am I identifying this as Rome and not Jerusalem? I think that's one of the reasons right there. I don't know of um, obviously Jerusalem killed a lot of the prophets. Uh, but in this day of time, the prophets and the saints and all who were slain on the earth. A lot of, a lot of people besides prophets and saints being slain. Um, and that seems to be more like Rome to me. We're going to get a little bit later on and we'll talk about the blood of the apostles uh, also being in her. So that's to me very definitive uh, for Rome. I don't know if were any apostles killed in Jerusalem besides James. Uh, I can't think of any. So uh, the saints rejoice. And uh, you see the full measure of that as we open up then chapter 19. Uh, I'm describing this chapter as um, the victory, reign, and judgment of Christ. Uh, John says, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. So you have four Hallelujahs or hallelujahs, praise the Lord, that are uttered here. Uh, the first of them uh, is from a great multitude uh, praising God's righteous judgment on the harlot. True and righteous are, are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He's avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Then again in verse 3, hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped him. He sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard a great multitude, and I heard as it were, a voice of a great multitude, the sound of many waters, the sound of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. I think Handel in a uh, Composing the Messiah used this text. Uh, I was going to say religiously, but you know what I mean. Uh, he used it. And that brings us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So God has, God has you know, judged the harlot. Heaven is rejoicing over that. He's praised for his justice and all of that. And you see that uh, being recognized in heaven. But then in verse 7, uh, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. So now uh, the church which has been espoused to Christ 
is uh, presented to him. And uh, she is uh, adorned in fine linen, it says in verse 8, clean and bright. The fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So it is what Christians do that beautify the bride. It is the deeds of the saints that make her beautiful. You would think, well, Christ died for her. He uh, paid, so, you know, paid the price so that she might be washed and clean and sanctified and all of that. But uh, I think the, the righteous deeds of the saints are almost like the ornaments, if you will. Uh, that's what I'm getting out of this text. I want to think about that with you more in just a minute. But let me read the next couple of verses. He says, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He said to me, These are the true sayings of God. I fell at his feet as if to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do it. I am a fellow servant of your brethren who have testified uh, the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So uh, John tries to worship this angel, but he's rebuked from doing that. That will happen again uh, later as well. But here's a, maybe one of the big rocks that I would take out of chapter 19. There might be a couple of them. But just what, what I was talking about a second ago, I like this. Um, it's kind of an old painting, and it's, it's not a very good uh, picture of it. But uh, you see in the train of the bride people, and that's what makes her adornment so beautiful, the righteous deeds of the saints. And to impress upon young people that the church is made beautiful by how you live your life. You're part of the church. You know, you, you're, you're an integral part of the church if you're a Christian. And when people disparage the church and say, well, it's, it's, it's not that glorious, it's not what it ought to be, well, we, we are the ones who are supposed to be making it uh, as we live for God, um, as He cleanses us and, and we do things in His name to honor Him and glorify Him. And that makes us um, what God intended us to be, and that is the bride for His Son. So I think that's an encouraging bit of uh, sort of picturesque picturesque language that might help young people. Any questions or thoughts to that point? I have a question. Yeah. Timing. Timing. At the end of chapter 18, the objection of the fall of Rome. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I think that that's, it's not linear. Um, obviously, the city of Rome and the empire of Rome are going to, and their efforts to quash Christianity are going to go down together. Uh, so you have the big battle in Revelation 19 of Armageddon, so to speak, and this just shows, shows particularly the city, what will happen to her. So I don't think that, that this uh, is, is linear really at all. In fact, I think much of Revelation cannot be uh, and, for, and by that I mean time, like you're looking at a timeline. Uh, it really isn't that way. Uh, What's the point of excuse me? What's the point of the yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't it right. Um, and, and that probably needs to be made because it's hard to get your mind around that when you're reading prophecy, period. I think Old Test- that's true in Old Testament prophecy as well, where... Um, it you know, skips around from it doesn't predict things you know in a linear fashion and it doesn't matter if you're talking about Daniel or whatever uh, just doesn't so that concept needs to be shared I think Doug. in chapter 18 uh, we have the reaction of what's happened is that in answer to chapter 6 that we studied where the same test how long how long before or is that something totally different? Well, I, I think it's part of the answer. To answer your question, yes. Here is God's venge, avenging the saints. In fact, but this whole section is what he does to Rome, the, the harlot, what he does to the beast, what he does to the false prophet. All of that is him avenging. Well, eventually it will be fully done. Right. Right. 
Yeah, but this is the particular thing that he was answering the saints under the altar for in the fifth seal. Uh, I think this whole uh, demonstration of his avenging them in these ways. Yes, sir. This had a thought on the woman displaying something. It's like First Peter 3, you know, here's the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Mm-hmm. She's displaying, you know, not the clothes or whatever, but what she's showing that is good, the great Christ inside of the Lord is this meek and quiet spirit. Here, uh, this tribe, you know, she's displaying, she has an ornament of the righteous deeds of the saints, you know, it's what, what should be shown. Yeah. It's good. Good thought. All right. That, oh, something back up there again. Can you get it? <laughs> it's not you. Uh, let's see, what does it say? Uh, I'm just going to edit it. It's whatever. There we go. I wasn't going to buy a license in the middle of class. All right. So that brings us to, it's not called it, but what we're going to see is, in essence, the, the Battle of Armageddon that we're introduced to in chapter 16 is actually fought, if you will, in the last half of chapter 19. So here's the, the victory reign and the judgment of Christ. Uh, I saw heaven open, verse 11 of chapter 19. Behold, a white horse, he who sat on him, called faithful and true, in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes uh, were like a flame of fire, on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. The armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Out of his mouth goes a sharp, sharp sword, that with it he should make, strike the nations. And he himself will rule over them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of, of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So this section obviously describing Christ, the warrior king that's going to come and win the victory. Um, it, it describes him with, with names and other sort of noun and adjective descriptions. And then it also describes him by his deeds. And so I'm going to kind of break that up and, and quickly go through that. Uh, he's, he's sitting on a white horse. And much like the first of the four horsemen in Revelation 6, uh, that's going to represent uh, purity. The good guys always ride the white horses, you know. Uh, he's, he's called faithful and true. Eyes like a fa- flame of fire. And that comes right out of the vision in Revelation 1. Uh, his eyes in Revelation 1 were like a flame of fire. Many crowns. Uh, he, he, he owns everybody's crown. He's the king of kings. You know, that's, he's called the king of kings at the, at the end of this. So that's the idea of having many crowns. A name written that no one knew. Uh, who can fully appreciate who Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is? Who can really understand his whole identity? You know, I think that may be a name written that no one knew. Uh, he, he's called so many great names in Scripture, and if you put them all together, still I'm not sure we have the full view <laughs> of who he is and how great he is. Um, so uh, and that may be some sort of indication of that. Uh, is is uh, clothed in a robe that's dipped in blood. That's obvious, obviously significant uh, of his sacrifice. He's called the Word of God, as he is also in John chapter 1, and then he's called the King of kings and Lord of lords. Um, then the deeds in righteousness he judges. Jesus himself said that the Father has delivered all judgment to me uh, in, in John chapter 5. Um, he, he leads the armies of heaven. He strike the nation, strikes the nations with a sharp two-edged sword proceeding out of his mouth. He rules with a rod of iron. That's uh, from the Psalms, uh, prophecy of how the Messiah would come and rule. And he tr- treads the winepress of the wrath of God. We saw that, I think, indicated in chapter Chapter 14. So the sharp two-edged sword proceeding out of his mouth, I think, is one of the most telling parts of this vision. When I teach this at, in, at ABS, I ask the students to tell me which one of these deeds or descriptions most says to you that this is Jesus Christ, that that's, this is who we're talking about. And you can look at those deeds, and then you can look at the descriptions, and 
there are several of them that, you know, it's hard to pick just one, is what most of them say. <laughs> it's hard to pick just one that is most descriptive of him. But so many of them point us to him. Um, but the sword coming out of his mouth, to me, is maybe the biggest tip off that this whole thing is highly symbolic. Uh, my students in 11th grade can easily tell me that the sword coming out of, out of his mouth represents the word of God. You know, you don't even have to try, right? That's the word of God is called a sword. Uh, and then if we get that, that this is his word that that's representing, uh, he's going to win this victory by the sword out of his mouth, which is his word, which makes this whole thing a spiritual battle. And the whole thing is represented, and that's why I'm saying this, this, may, this one point, obviously, I can't get too far off on this, but people that believe in premillennialism, like we're going to have some kind of literal Armageddon war, they don't see it with people riding horses. You know, it's tanks and nuclear bombs and uh, all that kind of stuff. That's the way they always, and they always try to justify that and work their way around it. But again, so many things out of this that they, for these people that say you have to take everything literally, they take almost nothing literally. I mean, that's just the reality of it. They, but they want to make symbolic the things that have to be symbolic, but take literally the things that they need for their theory. That's what they actually do. Uh, and it's, it's not consistent, it's dishonest, intellectually dishonest, and, and um, I think that is something that can be pointed out. It's a fascinating description of the battle as it unfolds. An angel calls birds together for the feast in ancient times and even sometimes in modern, uh, more modern, at least, trench warfare. Of course, the carrion birds and the vultures follow the armies because they know they get lunch, you know, regularly. And that's what that's describing. It's going to be a big battle with a lot of carnage. But again, in the spiritual sense. Uh, so he sees the, the two armies gather together to make war and then doesn't really give us a blow-by-blow blow description, but the beast and the false prophet are captured and they're cast into the lake of fire. So they're done away with. Um, if that beast is the Roman Empire, the false prophet, the Caesar worship and the false religion that goes along with the Roman Empire, that the land beast. So they're both done away with. Their followers then, look at this, are killed with the sword that proceeds from the mouth of the king. It's a spiritual battle and it's won by the word of God. When in the early 300s AD, Constantine issued the Edict of Toleration, about 323 I believe it was, um, the war was over. Diocletian had just a couple of uh, decades before then uh, pursued some of the hottest persecution against Christians uh, that existed in the entirety of the Roman Empire uh, just very shortly before the reign of Constantine. And yet, by the time Constantine and his mother had become a Christian, uh, that was, it was all done with. And it, went, it actually happened really, really quickly where Rome is a persecuting power and one that was oppressing Christians, uh, it just vanished. Caesar worship went away. Um, all of that just, and, and again, it happened really quickly when it did happen. It wasn't a gradual sort of thing. And it was done by the power of the gospel, that people would not give up the gospel. Um, and they loved their lives to the death earlier. Uh, so if you want to look at it in history, where I think that's it. Uh, again, there's different feelings about some of that, but I think, uh, to me, that, that's what it points to. You have, then, uh, in the next thing we see in chapter 20, the binding of Satan. I think we have time to cover most of this, so let's look at the binding of Satan for a little bit. In chapter 20, in verse 1, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, a great chain in his hand. So again, here, an angel introduces the next big part of the vision. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who's the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Uh, he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So Satan's power to do what he had done, and that's what's being bound here. Uh, 
symbolically the dragon is bound, but the idea is no longer will he deceive the nations. He will not be able to, uh, you know, manipulate a world empire to systematically persecute Christians. And if you think about it, from the time of Rome to right now today, that has not happened. Satan has been pre prevented from doing that. There have been persecutions here and there, but it's nothing like, a, an, a, in essence, a worldwide systematic persecution of Christians by this evil empire. It just hasn't happened. You know, there have been per Christians, the promise, of course, is that all who live godly will suffer persecution. So that's always going to be there, but not like it was in the, in the time of Rome. Um, Satan's bound and pre he's prevented from doing that for a long period of time, a thousand years, and I believe that we're still in that thousand years. Um, but then uh, you, you read on and um, he says, I saw thrones, they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. I saw the souls who had been beheaded for their witness of the word of God, who worship the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Um, maybe even the souls under the altar might be under consideration in part of that. Uh, the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So I believe the resurrection, as it's described here, represents, uh, in essence, the emergence of the cause of Christ out of apparent complete death and destruction. And it's quite similar in my estimation to, as many things are in the book of Revelation, to the prophecy in Ezekiel. In this case, Ezekiel chapter 37, uh, verses 10 through 14, you guys know the vision of the dry bones, right? Just quickly to remind you of that, Ezekiel's taken, he's is, is shown this valley of dry bones, they're very dry, and he's asked, can these come back to life? Well, you know, God says, I, I can make them come back to life. And then Ezekiel watches as, you know, the sinews come together and the flesh is put back on them and God breathes into them. And that whole, those, those dry bones represent, you think about where Ezekiel was in Babylonian captivity. At this point in the book of Ezekiel, Jerusalem has been wiped out, completely destroyed, almost wiped off the face of the earth. And what would you say about the nation of Israel? It was a goner. It was a goner. But God shows Ezekiel this vision of this valley of dry bones and says, I can bring him back to life. It's going to be a resurrection. And it was a resurrection of the nation of Israel. Seventy years later, they came back and all of a sudden the nation of Israel was there, right? God made it happen. The temple was rebuilt. The walls were re rebuilt. And, and, and so, it was, so it is spiritually with the church. The church was very nearly, don't kid yourself, very nearly wiped out by Roman persecution. I mean, it was very close to obliterating all of Christianity. Uh, but it didn't happen. And God brings it back to life. Um, and, and I, so, again, it's hard to know for certain some of these symbols, but it seems to me that connecting up with several other things we've looked at, that this makes sense. Y'all have any th other thoughts about that? Yeah, look like the, the good guys were about wiped out in Elijah's day as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'll say this about that. Uh, this, that point needs to be made. Let, let me explain. Um, shortly come to pass, shortly come to pass. But I think anybody uh, with any reason at all would understand that a thousand years is a long period of time, right? No matter if it's symbolic, literal, or whatever it is, that's a long period of time. And plainly, the thousand years then is not under the realm of shortly come to pass. But John is giving a view of... Uh, on you know, the very end of time. The thousand years is what tells us that. That you have it shortly come to pass, shortly come to pass is when all this is going to happen. But wait, there's a thousand years. And I want to show you eventuality where about heaven and, and the reward of the saints and all of that sort of thing. And that, that, is, that is our only justification for saying really that anything in the book is, is beyond the shortly come to pass time. Uh, the prophets 
They used that kind of language. There was prophecy about uh, Babylon, for instance, that was made about 200 or, and something years before it occurred. And this would have been this prophecy also about 200 and something years before it occurred. So that would still fly. It said it would shortly happen. God prophesied that would happen to Babylon shortly. And it was about 200 years when it did. So again, that falls into the realm of what we know Bible prophecy can mean. Uh, and the thousand years here then, getting back to Brent's point, is the very thing that says, here's the one part of the book that is not shortly come to pass. All right. The loosing of Satan occurs after the thousand-year reign. Uh, evil may, once again, uh, gain control of powerful institutions. Uh, and it looks like ancient enemy of God will again arise. And uh, again, John channels Ezekiel uh, here just a couple of chapters after chapter 37, which is the, the resurrection the, you know, from, from the dry bones. Ezekiel 38 and 39, Gog and Magog. Um, literal enemies of God's people but used symbolically even in that prophecy. But they all again began to move against God's people. So again ancient enemies. And you know what is that? Well probably paganism idolatry, uh, worship of things we ought not to be worshiping and those kinds of things make strong move against God's people and apparently it looks like uh, something bad's going to happen but it does not um, because what does happen is um, they went up over the breadth of the earth in verse 9, surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And then the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So I do think that's a, a bit of a picture of the end of time there, just a glimpse, uh, so that John can to the point of describing heaven for us. Judgment in heaven is really where he's going with it. And uh, I don't know who took that s snapshot of the lake of fire, but uh, it w had to be a, a pretty tough uh, photographer mi mission, I would say. <laughs> All right, need to stop there. Uh, any questions or other thoughts before? We're gl I'm glad we have an extra class period this time. I do intend to finish, and we should not have too much trouble doing that Sunday. And I can give you a quick review also of all of the book of Revelation in about five minutes that I think will be helpful. Uh, I, make this the, I make that the final for my kids at ABS nowadays, being able to go through the book of Revelation, tell me what it's about. And you'll be able to do that by the end of class Sunday morning, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you.